Those of you who don't know George, um, he's been around for a long time, and he is the owner of Foothill Sunny out in Colton. And um, and I'll let you, I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. But we're very pleased to have him here again tonight. Thanks, George. talking about what you want, why um, hopefully there'll be time for questions, all right? So uh, I'm not trying to, con to convert anybody and I'm not trying to create any particular controversy, but I, I understand as I look around and I know a few people and I don't know most of you, that beekeeping has become uh, kind of a faith-based belief system. <laughs> uh, and so I have my own beliefs and I think that I, uh, from experience and so forth and so on, um, am speaking from, I try to be as objective as possible. But I do realize that some of the things that I'm, I may say may bother some people's belief systems about honeybees. But America, right? You can have your own opinion, and I'll have your own opinion. You have a microphone. I do have the microphone. So, so, let's just start out with some really basic. In fact, this whole thing is really pretty basic. I um, never know exactly where to begin and where to end and how deep to go and so forth and so on. But if we just start and talk about wintering bees, well, let's think about what. When bees are successful over wintering, what characteristics do they most commonly have? Uh, so usually they start out with large populations of healthy winter bees, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, they usually have a young, vigorous queen. There are always exceptions to almost everything. They usually have 60 to 80 pounds of honey, and it is properly situated inside of the colony. And they've been protected from moisture intrusion. Moisture is a real problem in Western Oregon for bees and humans. Um, they're usually protected from excessive winds. And they usually are facing south so that they get exposure to the sun, even though the sun's lower and for fewer hours. So those are the characteristics. And with your hives, you may not be able to do all of these things, but this is what most hives that most commonly have that are successful in overwintering. So let's just go through some of these things. So what are healthy winter bees? I can't talk about every single part of this, but bees that have been had pests or predators or other problems, pathogens, that have weakened them in any way will not winter as well. And winter bees are special bees. They're not the same as summer bees. They've been biologically altered by the season and by their uh, preparation for winter. And uh, they have a much longer life span for a variety of reasons than bees that live in the summertime. So anything that would shorten their lifespan or would reduce the population would have an effect on the ability of the colony to overwinter. You know, basic stuff. So in the middle of this cluster, you will see that there's one bee whose wings are crumbled. Okay? And this, I wanted to talk more about this than anything else, because it is a common and yet um, not discussed problem. And uh, this is what's called deformed wing virus. And deformed wing virus is a very common virus. It's been here for a long, long time, recognized. But usually, a healthy colony doesn't really have much of a problem with this virus. It's airborne, doesn't get into the body because of the hard exoskeleton and, and the, the uh, activities of the bees. But because the varroa mite actually punctures 
the exoskeleton of the bee and carries this virus, it actually, in effect, injects it into developing bees or adult bees, either one. And so when varroa mites are present in the hive, we will see quite a bit of this. And, when it, and even when the varroa mites by themselves aren't causing a serious problem in the hive, you can see lots of this. Well, if it was just a few bees, it wouldn't matter. But this time of year, the bees that are hatching out are going to be your winter bees. If you lose a lot of them, then you're not going to have very many, uh, enough cluster size in order to maintain temperature and keep everything going and stuff. Now, it isn't common, but a lot of people have never seen this before. And it's because they're not looking. They're looking at the queen, they're looking at the brood, they're looking at the honey, they're looking at a lot of things, and a few of these bees wandering around are not necessarily catching your attention. We had a situation a couple of years ago which brought this to our attention in a big way, where we were watching, uh, we worked so hard to get some brood out of a situation where we needed to get the bees to build back up again, and we were ha watching it hatch out, and nearly 100% of the hatching brood had this at a time of the year when we really needed those bees. Well, they don't last more than a day or two. The hive won't tolerate them. They throw them out. They're dead. They, they, they have no use to the hive whatsoever. So I'm just saying this. When we're talking about healthy, we're not just talking about Varroa, but we're also talking about some viruses. And Varroa has uh, opened up the door to viruses which we never used to pay any attention to. Certainly doesn't vector all the viruses, but there are half a dozen serious ones that are. And deformed wing is the one that you can actually see the symptoms of if you're looking carefully at emerging brood. So there are some other things that you need to pay attention to, but let's just keep moving here and I'll try and answer questions or catch up or do we will. So what does a large population mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you have to have three boxes full of bees um, in fact, there's some indication that when you have these super huge colonies, they have a tendency to get smaller over the winter. And the ones that are kind of a smaller, say four to six frames or something like that, have a tendency to get a little bigger to compensate for it. And you end up with somewhere between eight or nine frames no matter what. So the question is that we ask ourselves, well, is it worth a whole lot of effort and time in order to get these super big colonies? Or is there some other number? But a large colony is one that, uh, or a large population is one that's more than a softball sized cluster. It's more than, than a frame or two of bees. Um, so could you overwinter a single box of bees? Yeah, a lot of people do that. The problem that you come across with this is that if you have that many bees and you have a queen that's trying to lay, it's hard to get 60 to 80 pounds of honey in there, and so you may find it running out of honey in the spring sometime. Whereas the second box, it may only be one box of bees, but the second box would give you enough food so that you wouldn't have to worry about running out. That's the only issue. Certainly, if you have 8, 9, 10 frames of bees, that is a large enough cluster at say 60 degrees, 65 degrees, it would shrink when it gets colder, but your cluster needs to be pretty solid. Um, so you can see while it warmed up, gosh, it would fill up a box. When you have colonies, I'll talk a little bit about colonies that are smaller than that. It's really common. You don't have to be embarrassed about it, it happens. But um, there are, you know, it's, it's real common to have colonies that are smaller than that. And a lot of people go to a lot of effort and wishing and praying that small clusters will get through. But your chances of succeeding are diminished pretty significantly. So what's a young vigorous queen? Well, a young vigorous queen is young. She's a year older or younger. And um, there's a lot of really good data to show that just because you have a two or three year old queen, uh, it doesn't mean that she she's going to fail, but your chances of your colony overwintering successfully with those older queens is far less, significantly less, than if the queen is a 
a year old or less. So that's a reason that you might consider requeening. Now, if you're trying to maintain some genetic stock or something like that, well, you might, you know, you might go to some lengths to try and maintain it. But um, just in general, uh, and on average, changing queens so that they're young will give you more success. The queen has to be laying a pipe pattern. It can't be scattered all over the place. Uh, a loose pattern like that is an indication of either a disease or she's running out of sperm and can't lay, or she's just getting old and she just can't do it. In the spring, most queens, no matter what age, will lay a pretty tight pattern or a very tight pattern. But by now, after a whole season, uh, of the older queens will have a tendency to, to be a little sloppy and lazy, uh, or tired, maybe is a better word. Um, and it's definitely harder to get old queens to respond to stimulus. So if you're needing to get them to lay a lot of eggs in order to build up your winter cluster, an older queen, it's just a whole lot harder to get to do that because she's ready to shut down. She's been working all year and doesn't want to do that. So um, it's not a yes, no, it's not a black, white. It's just a matter of percentages. The younger the queen is, the more likely she is. But that doesn't mean that a young, young queen can't fail or can't be really crappy. I mean, you have to look and you have to measure her success by what she's doing. A lot of people know how old their queens are by the paint dot that they or somebody have put on there, and there are, is a, a uh, universal color group <coughs> which you can look up and find out what color for what year, and then you, you know. And if you put in a color uh, this year, and then when you go back and check, and there's a queen in there, and she's laying, but she doesn't have a paint dot on her, well, that's not the queen you put in. <laughs> but it may, you know, it doesn't mean she's bad, it just means that they didn't like yours and they replaced her. So, most common causes for winter mortality. Uh, and what does it look like? So, from the surveys, it's pretty clear that uh, the most common thing is just plain starvation. And uh, starvation will, uh, the population will hold past Christmas, past New Year's usually, and then they'll um, decline rapidly with lots of dead bees head in into the cells. There may be honey in the colony, but the cluster, because it was either too small or was too cold or whatever, couldn't move to the honey, and so the cluster just fails. So, but the, the key thing is here that uh, they die, many of them will die with their heads into the cell, and there's hardly anything else that will ever happen like that. So if you see it, uh, and there will be lots of these pile up at the bottom board, dead, and uh, decaying uh, around here, February and March, but even into May, we'll have, uh, in fact, May it could very well be the most common month for starvation. The colony will get started, we'll raise a lot of brood, and then we'll get three weeks of rain, and the bees can't get out, they're committed to the brood, and that's it. So, uh, you know, you need to watch this all through the spring, but that's when, it, around here, February and March, very common for starvation. Uh, so diseases and pests, so uh, you can see this happening already, they decline over time. There are often no dead bees in the colony, um, and this happens all through the fall and winter, and it seems to be more gradual rather than sudden. Queen problems are the third most common uh, cause of colony loss, and what you'll see is a disorganized, and that's a really subjective statement, disorganized, what is that? But if you've had these for a while, you kind of get a sense when you open up the hive, what it should sound like, what the bees, the motion of the bees, how they're spread on the combs, what it should be. When there's no queen uh, for any period of time, then the colony will very often do a lot of wandering and spreading. They will do, a, uh, sometimes they'll fan and, and make a noise, which, uh, uh, kind of a droning noise that will it is indication that they don't have a queen and they know it. But uh, so you can usually see it in the brood if there should be brood in the colony at that time of the year, and you have a very poor pattern or no brood whatsoever, or you might have a drone layer, uh, in which case you'd only have drone cells no matter what kind of comb was laid on. Um, there may be queen cells, but not always. 
These don't always do what the book says they're supposed to do. They must not have read that book. Um, and what will happen is that uh, often the bees, because it's cold and they're clustered and stuff, they'll, they'll be there. But as the old bees die in the spring, then uh, there are no young bees to replace them. So the cluster will just dribble down to nothing. And, uh, and at some point, often, they'll just leave, just fly away. They're, they know that it's hopeless and they'll just give up. It's gone. So, since bees are wild animals, and wild animals know how to take care of themselves, why do we have to go out and do anything special to get bees ready for winter? Why don't they just do this on their own? Don't they know? I mean, uh, so let's just go through some of the reasons why bees might not get ready for winter. Well, one thing is that they're not perfect. They make lots of mistakes. They don't necessarily notice they don't have a queen. Um, and sometimes they will do things that are just downright stupid, like swarm in, in October. Uh, and there may be a reason for it, but we, we don't know what it is. I, you know, you see these kinds of crazy things. So bees do crazy things. But let's just talk a little bit about what bees are thinking about. They don't think, but what it is they're up to. They are a wild animal. And even though we keep them in our boxes, they're still wild animals. And animals, as a general reason, just want to survive as a species. That's the bottom line. They, one of the things they might not care about at all, well, they might not care whether you make a big honey crop, because that's not important to them. And they might not care whether the hive is alive in your backyard, as long as there's one a half a mile down the road on the side of somebody's building. They just want to make sure, as a survival instinct, to make sure that there are enough bees so that the species will survive. So in the big sense, how do they do that? Well, again, not knowing, but I guess as a species realizing that bears come along and smash them, and uh, sometimes they starve or freeze, or sometimes um, there's a drought, there's no honey or queens fail, don't get mated properly or at all. There are all kinds of things that can happen. And as a species, they know that. And they make sure that the species doesn't just dwindle down to nothing through a series of bad incidences. They replace themselves with swarms. Not, with, not just with individual bees, but with swarms. So bees, will, if they're left to their own devices, will swarm once a year. Most hives will. And even now we have all these problems, bees still swarm. And they may even swarm more often if they feel a sense of desperation. And that might explain some of what happens when things go wrong. But even when things were not as troubled as they are today, if you went out and people did and counted the number of swarms in a square mile in an area they would be about one per square mile. And you'd have a good year, and maybe there'd be 1.5 per square mile. And then you'd have a bad winter, and they'd go down to 0.9 per square mile or whatever. But through the good years and the bad years, there was always about the same number of bees in an open area. But every hive swarmed. So you had one, then you had two because it swarmed. But when you count the number of successful colonies in the neighborhood, it's always the same. So if you think about it a little bit, all the bees need to do is to survive. And that means that they just need a 50% success rate. And if they have that or close to that, over time, they will uh, survive as a species. So that isn't much help to you trying to make a crop of honey or keep your hive in your backyard alive. I think that it's fair to say that these are not going to go extinct from what we is happening. It's not a good thing, it's not a happy thing, but the bees are still swarming. And in fact, Dr. Gary, uh, Tom Seeley at Cornell has made uh, a life's work out of kind of some interesting work studying wild colonies in a large forest area behind Cornell University. And 
a long time ago. He's the guy that wrote Honeybee Democracy. Great book. You should read it. It's very, very interesting. About decision making with bees and, and extrapolating to humans a little bit. Um, so uh, he actually started when he was a very young graduate student uh, doing bee lining to follow the bees into the forest to find out in this particular plot where there were no commercial bees, no hobbyist bees, it was just it's a huge area and uh, he used bee lining to find where they were and what trees and stuff and he mapped them and he came back on a regular basis every few years and he mapped them again and he's found through his 40 or so years of research from before Varroa to after Varroa that guess what? About the same number of, of trees are occupied by bees now as they were at any one time. It's gone up, it's gone down, but it's always been very, very steady. He's looked at what happens and they do have Varroa mites. He got in there and so you think, well, that proves the bees can't, and when they're left alone, can survive with Varroa mites. But then you ask the question, well, are they in the same trees? Are they actually surviving? And he says, actually, they're never in the same trees from one inspection to the next inspection. So what's happening? The parent colony's dying. The swarm is going out, occupying a new space. The old space is destroyed by wax moths and mice and other things, which is a good thing. It's a way to get rid of American fowl brood and the comb and any spores or any other pathogens that might be carried by that stuff, uh, by the comb or in the hive. But it's just good enough that there's always the same number of hives out there, but not good enough that they've taken over the earth. And if these were much more successful than they are, we would have been this deep in bees a long time ago if they had too much success. So, what does this mean? It's a long explanation for bees aren't perfect. And you can't depend on bees in your backyard without help to be there. Now, you may not care if you are somehow satisfied that, well, they're a mile away in somebody else's barn or whatever. But if you want your hive to be alive, then you're going to have to give it a little bit better chance. That's all I'm saying. Uh, so, bees do not have any natural defense against burrowings. And you say, well, if we just would stop treating them and let, them, let the ones that are susceptible die and just work with the ones that survive, we get to find... But, We've been trying to do that through selection, on the one hand, and through ignoring, on the other hand. There are tens of millions of hives that have been left unmanaged in the world, in the Western Hemisphere probably, um, for 25 years. Have we found yet, from those untended bees, anything that has much, much uh, is gonna, giving us any, any hope? Uh, that there is a natural defense. It hasn't happened. Now, if we gave it two or three or four hundred years, maybe, or a thousand or five thousand years, maybe, maybe, but not 25 years, it's not enough. And there just doesn't seem, now there are some glimmers of hope. There are some bees that can be selected for, unfortunately it's a very difficult selection, that seem to notice that, like the Apis serrana, that's the native host, <coughs> that there's a mite in there and they'll take and they'll pull the brood out with the mite, throw it outside and destroy it. Of course it ruins the brood, but it also gets rid of the mite. And it seems to keep a lid on. And some selections seem to show some tendency to do that, although it's it's not where uh, where it's really a dependable uh, substitute because at some point you're going to the levels get to a point where you, it isn't enough. There is also some work at Purdue University where um, they've noticed that dead mice on the bottom where some of them have their legs chewed off or other parts of the burrow might are chewed on. And so, uh, again, they seem to, uh, it's a difficult to select for, and it doesn't seem to be, it's not recessive, but it's not a dominant genetic trait. So, um, a lot of work and still, you're not getting all of them, you're only getting a percentage of them. Um, so, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And there's no place to hide. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And so, um, that's 
That's just the truth. And I, you can say, well, that's a belief system, but I don't think any objective scientist would disagree with this. So these are opportunistic, but this isn't home. This isn't where they came from. They're not native to the Western Hemisphere. And so uh, there are all kinds of things. They're very opportunistic, and they adapt very nicely. But there's some things that if it was a perfect world, <laughs> they would change. And so, uh, you know, they're a Mediterranean. Originally, we used to think it was Northern Africa, but it turns out it might have been Asia. Uh, who knows? But at any rate, it's not home. And so they have to create life in, and, uh, and they are on every continent except the uh, Antarctica. Or is that the continent or is it part of the Arctic anyway? But, uh, and, they, and they succeed because they, uh, they are so opportunistic and adaptable. But, you know, this isn't always the perfect place for them to be, so they might not just automatically succeed. Western Oregon, in particular, does not have a fall honey flow, and we, but we do have a significant winter. So we're great in the spring, lots of pollen and lots of nectar, and although in the city where the people are, are planting exotic plants and native plants and watering them, um, you know, you, it, you might not notice it quite so much, but, um, you know, as dry as it was in August and, and September, it was tough, tough on bees. And so, in terms of trying to get bees ready for winter by building new young bees to become winter bees, that is a big flaw, it's a big problem. And so you may find you need to make up for that, uh, that situation here, whereas if you were in another part of the country that had um, uh, thunder showers all through the summer and the fall and still warm temperatures and maybe your golden rod did real well or you had something down along the Gulf Coast that bloomed or whatever, I mean, you, you might not have this problem. You might have a different problem, but you, you might not have our problem. <clears throat> you can have a really bad year. You can lose all of your bees to starvation just because it's just a really bad year. Um, and you can have really severe or unusual weather. So, I mean, there are, it's not an excuse, it's just reality, you know. It isn't going to be automatic. If you leave your bees alone, you know, sometimes they'll do fine, and other times you'll find that you will probably lose them unless you supplement Mother Nature. So, uh, controlling pests and diseases is important, uh, especially Varroa, but there are some others. Uh, you need to at least be mo monitoring your varroa mites to know uh, what levels you have. And so I'm just going to really quickly go through um, just a little bit of arithmetic. So if you test most of them either with powdered sugar or with alcohol or something like that, and you, you get a number of phoretic mites, that's mites that are on the back of, backs of adult bees, per 100. And usually the tests will take a half a cup or something like that and, and you divide it by three because that's 300 bees usually by measure and, uh, and count the number of mites that you found in your sample and that's your number of mites per 100 bees. Now, if you found four mites in 100 bees, and let's just use some really round numbers, let's say that your colony had 40,000 bees in it, so you take your four mites and you multiply it times uh, what? 400. And that's the number of mites that are on the backs of bees. And then you multiply that times 5 because about 80% of the mites are in the brood and would never be caught in your sample. So you get to 2,000. Oh, 5, 6, 7. No, oh, you're, you're less than 10,000. Let's say if you found 10 in your sample, which isn't uncommon this time of year, then all of a sudden you do the math and you start finding that you have uh, 20,000 mites or thereabouts in a 40,000 hive, uh, bee hive. One mite on every two bees. And you want to have a large population of healthy, unchewed on, unsucked on, unbeat up bees to overwinter, and yet every other one has a mite. So, knowing that, 
you know, you want to get that number down below three, probably below two if you possibly can. Um, my, my populations double every month through the summer, and uh, even more than that right now. As your bees stop raising drones, where most of the drones start out as the most likely place for mites to go, but as they stop raising drones, then the mites jump onto the workers, and so the damage increases almost exponentially in late September and October. So um, these numbers need to be monitored and kept under control. Uh, when you have levels that are three and lower, uh, viruses are still showing up. So at three, a lot of uh, deformed wing viruses can show up. Um, you almost have to assume you're going to treat. Some people treat in spring and think they're okay, but you really ought to, if you do that, it might work, it might not work, but if it does, great. If it doesn't, you should be monitoring in the fall to make sure you don't get past those thresholds. Um, and then you need to verify that your treatment worked because if your neighbors are not treating or the wild colonies, the swarms that are around you are not treating, those mites, many of them will end up in your hive after you have cleaned up your mite load. So you do need to check them well into October to make sure that you didn't get a reinfestation. Okay, so mid-September was the, the latest window for mite control, although I don't know that it's ever too late, but if you do wait too late and your mite levels are too high, you can kill a lot of mites. Your bees are just simply too damaged, and uh, it might be too late for the cluster. But uh, at any rate, it depends really if we have an Indian summer or, um, you know, if we get bad weather starting here in two weeks and we could, it happens, um, it's too late. If we got a month, month and a half of decent weather, um, you know, you still have a chance to raise some root. So, um, obviously, American fowl root, you just can't have it. Uh, it will destroy your colony and it will destroy all the other colonies in your apiary and in your neighborhood uh, if you don't control it. It's very, very contagious. And so that's an antibiotic. Um, tylosin is bad and good. Tylosin is replacing teramycin. Teramycin, it's turning out, it's, it's fairly innocuous. I mean, we use it as humans for acne and other, and as a generally used antibiotic. Um, so it's around a lot, but uh, American fowl root is, big, is beginning to be resistant to it in many areas. And so tylosin is a stronger. Uh, antibiotic and it lasts much longer in the hive but so that's good because you control your American fowl root but it's bad because you don't really want it in your hive any longer than is necessary and so it is prescribed only not as prophylactic excuse me uh, not just for every hive but only when you see symptoms and it's very effective so and then the viruses which we don't really have any direct control over but um, we do know that many of them are vectored by by uh, varroa levels so, and mice can do a lot of damage, although they're not going to probably run you out of business. Uh, but it sure makes you mad. You raise your heart rate and blood pressure. And then there's a new one. Um, you'll have a uh, brood that starts showing up kind of like this kind of spotty. Now, it could be a poor queen and it could be other things, but um, certainly we've noticed that we'll get this sometimes when we're in blueberries where they spray a lot of, spray a lot of fungicides. But, there's another one out there which is related to apparently European fowl brood. I think Dewey has uh, called it snot brood. Uh, it, and if you take samples and send them into the lab, they will say that it has European fowl brood in it, but it's pretty clear that it's not your grandfather's European fowl brood. It stays all through the summer and colonies can die from it, whereas European fowl brood is. Uh, Usually is a stress disease in the spring, and once the weather strains out, the hive, uh, the hive just cleans itself up. But this seems to stick around, and it can cause colonies to, to go downhill. Does we seem to respond to teramycin, uh, and um, some people say, well, requeening, uh, certainly requeening and giving them some protein supplement or something like that will at least give uh, the hive a second chance. It may break back down again. Uh, there's a, some conversation about that. 
So young, vigorous queen, I think I went through this uh, pretty much already. Uh, these are the signs of a good queen. It's not so much what she looks like, it's what she does. And you want to always be watching for this because you can be into a hive one week and then three weeks later you can come in and, and, sh and your queen will have gone uh, bad in that time. She just ran out of sperm and so she started laying, laying drones only and you'll start seeing queen cells uh, everywhere when the hive recognizes that they're in trouble. But they don't always. So, greening winter bees, so the, generally speaking in our area, September to October, egg laying uh, will cause bees to prepare themselves for winter. Uh, winter bees have to live, not for a few weeks, five weeks or thereabouts as an adult, but for three or four months. And part of that is the way they prepare themselves by uh, ingesting lots of protein and getting their fat bodies up. Um, they don't fly as much, but uh, these bees, just like summer bees, do have a clock. It's just it runs slower. It takes four months to run out. But um, it's important that that clock is going to run as long a period of time. That's why you don't want to have damaged bees. And uh, also, rest is really, really important. Um, there was some good work done in the Fresno area by Dr. Frank Eichen, where he had bees that were put down in the San Joaquin Valley floor where it's warm and they were active all winter long and everybody thought, oh shoot, you know, I mean, we, they'll be great because they don't have any cold stress and they even tried to stimulate them with nectar and, you know, with sugar syrup and all the substitute and then they took some similar bees, started them out and put them up in the Sierras where it was uh, cold and they clustered and Lo and behold, the next spring, the bees that were bigger and stronger and more vigorous were the ones that were in the mountains. And the ones in the valley had just flown all winter long and hadn't really accomplished anything, and they'd run their clock down. And the colonies had declined rather than grown. Uh, even with massive stimulation, the best they could do was to keep them level. So, uh, rest is good. I think rest is good. And uh, so, um, you know, you don't want to be doing things that are going to cause the bee, bees in the wintertime to have to do any more work than they have to. So, um, in order to get these populations of these bees at this time, you may need to stimulate them, or want to stimulate them. And uh, we found that by using protein and carbohydrate at the same time, you have much more success than when doing just one or the other. Both of them at the same time create much more root rearing. And the timing of this, of course, is important. If you do it too late, it gets too cold and the bees won't be very likely to raise much. If you do it too early, then you're, um, you know, you're starting too early and they wear themselves out as, as summer bees and they're not there when you need them. So this, this September, October time period is actually quite important. And uh, if you do start simulation, try to avoid long breaks because the queen will get all geared up and then you'll stop, and then she'll stop, and then if you want her to go again, she says, screw you, and just doesn't want to do it. So once you get her going, try and keep her going as long as you want, and then stop, rather than just little spurts. So we don't have this. I mean, in the, in the springtime, we might have something like this. It might not look like this in Portland, but I mean, you have acres and acres of forage, and, but in the fall time, we don't have this. You, you couldn't expect to find it at all. And so, um, but we want to have this kind of a really nice combination of honey and brood and <coughs> a big, thick row of pollen, multicolored as much as possible. The best nutrition we can possibly give them. Give them. And yet, you know, we're looking at pretty uneven weather and bloom and moisture, all of that. So. We still have to get this somehow. I don't know about you, um, Glenn, are you seeing a lot of real bright orange pollen coming in now in your hives? Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming in our area that's almost all that, that false dandelion. Um, but uh, last month it was uh, mostly Queen Anne's lace. I mean, it's just <laughs> everywhere. And, but it's a much lighter pollen. Um, 
those are both good nutrition pollens and nutritious pollens, and then there are a lot of other things that are out there in smaller amounts. Uh, and the things you plant in your garden are important, but realizing that any one hive needs a full, solid acre of forage at any time of the year in order to give it nutrition. So your yard is not going to do that. But what you do and your neighbors do collectively is important. And so it is important what the parks do, what the what people do with their with their front yards and all of that. And if the bees just aren't getting it or if you're worried about it, then you're just going to have to supplement it. And both protein and carbohydrate. So configure the hive for winter. I hope I'm not running. Am I okay for time? All right. Um, a real important thing is if you have uh, that you make sure that the hive volume is the right size for your cluster. So people say, well, how many boxes should I winter in? Well, it depends on how big your cluster is. You really want your cluster to be able to kind of fit in the box, and it's not going to be too uh, a small cluster in a great big space, no matter how much of it is honey. Um, it would be much, much better if you put it into a smaller box if it's small, and into a larger box if it's large with the proper amount of, uh, of feed. So water, when you get wet, it doesn't have to be very cold, and you're miserable. And the bees are the same exact way. So <coughs> if there's a way that water's getting into your hive, then you need to stop that. It may be rainwater or blown in by the wind. That's one obvious one. Uh, so think about how you might be able to avoid that. Uh, another one is, um, Honey is 20% moisture, so when they eat it, if your hive is completely tight and glued together, that moisture rises as hot air and condenses and then drips down on the cluster, and it can get wet if your colony is too, is too tight. So think about some ventilation at the top so that hot, warm, moist air can be expelled. Uh, doesn't have to be a big entrance or anything like that, just some way. So after they glue everything together and they've settled down, a lot of people will go out and take their lid somehow and they'll just lift it and put a matchstick or a nail or something just so the air can get out. And uh, the other way that moisture can get into a hive is actually from the ground. And it's amazing if your bees are on the ground how much they can soak up. And that moisture, of course, is uh, important. If you have all that debris on the bottom board and it gets wet and you get mold and you get slugs and you get all kinds of stinky things and creepy crawlies and stuff in there, and that isn't good either. Yeah. So the question about uh, uh, giving a little ventilation with a matchstick or a or a nail uh, is there also does that also have the risk of letting in too much cold air, or is that not not really negative? negative? Well, I mean, it seems like a contradiction, but we're really not giving much there. Okay. And, you know, you don't want to take the lid off. And I've always wondered about the open bottom boards, the screen bottom boards and stuff. It just seems like that's too much. And in fact, uh, in reading, I don't, don't use them, so I don't know. But in reading, it seems like a lot of people will do something to reduce that just air, just not free air coming through and stuff. But bees can, bees can move stuff around. If the cluster's big enough, they can, they can regulate temperatures and, and air and do all of that stuff. But you just don't want to have a big blast of cold Arctic air coming through and, and making it hard to run. That's all I was saying there. Again, it's uh, yeah. there's no hard and fast rule. So ventilation for moist air. Um, so placement in the sun, uh, if it's at all possible. It isn't so much that the bees are going to fly, but if you can get them in the sun during the day, then it will warm up that side and it will they'll be able to move around. And if they consume all the honey that they are touching, it will allow them to move over to where the honey is stored. That's really all you need. It's kind of nice to have them be able to take a cleansing flight during the winter. Uh, if you have snow and stuff, and then you get sun on the hive, you'll see all kinds of little yellow dots in the snow. You know, they, they do have to poop, so. <laughs> so stores. High quality ripened honey, 68 pounds, that's about the equivalent of 1D. Uh, so you don't want to have unripened honey, a little bit of uncapped honey is all right, but uh, 
you know, if you feed too late and the bees haven't had a chance to really uh, process it completely, then it's wet and that's, and it might ferment. Granulated honey is a lot harder for them to deal with. When I say high quality, it doesn't have to be light or dark, but if you end up in a place where your bees are picking up a lot of uh, honeydew from late sources, non-floral stuff, this can be really hard on bees. It has so much mineral matter in it and other issues, it's hard for them to digest and it can cause dysentery and other problems. Um, I, you can, I don't know that you want to take that stuff out, if you can even find it, but you might want to dilute it some with some, uh, with some sucrose. And actually there have been some, Dewey's probably taking notes copiously and to contradict everything I'm saying, but um, as it turns out, sucrose is of course a, a part of nectar. Most floral nectars, it's not all sucrose, but a lot of it, it is a part of their diet. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, however, is not, but it's close. Uh, but um, it's a very clean burning carbohydrate. They know how to handle it in their digestive systems, and it doesn't have a lot of mineral matter and so forth. So it is used as almost pure energy, whereas if you have a real dark honey or something like that, or especially a low quality honeydew or something like that, it may, um, it doesn't burn clean. It's not. You know, it's hard for them to digest and use, and it forces them to have to take a lot of cleansing flights at a time when perhaps they're not available, and that can cause problems in the hive. So sucrose is, if I had a choice I, and I had to feed, I would use sucrose, and uh, unless there's some reason why you think that's uh, either too expensive or it's not available. Um, high fructose corn syrup works, and really I know a lot of people, this is part of a belief system too, but Bees can handle it. I think that it's fine in the spring and summer when bees can fly a lot. Uh, but I don't know that it's the best feed at times when bees are, are uh, cooped up. But you want to feed, do all your feeding now and complete it well before Thanksgiving and avoid emergency feeding if you possibly can. Because uh, well, you want it to be two to one rather than one to one, which is very stimulative, so that they actually store it rather than burn it, and uh, the honey should be primarily above the cluster because the cluster will follow the heat and will go up. Anyone have top bar hives here? Okay, I don't have top bar hives, but I just, I thought this was kind of interesting. The recommendation is that you put your honey all on one side because if you put honey on both sides, then the cluster will be forced to go in two directions. It will split itself, perhaps will start because it can't, it just can't maintain its cluster. So, Anyway, so, but the, with a Langstroh hive, if you put it above, it will follow the heat and just keep going up and use it up uh, that way. Um, and if there are no pollen stores, bees will not be able to start brooding later in the winter when they're not flying. So that, that pollen band is pretty important to get an early start. So, uh, uh, I don't know if I really talk about this apparently here, maybe it comes up later, but at any rate, before Thanksgiving, and avoid emergency feeding. So if you feed bees in an emergency way, it's like keeping bees on the valley floor in the San Joaquin Valley. They have to do all that work to process that food, and it breaks the cluster, creates heat, and when they do that, then they actually uh, eat more than they would if you didn't feed. So you're creating a deficit, and once you start feeding, you almost have to, have to keep feeding. Yeah? Could you talk about that two to one, one to one again? Because I'm also trying to balance that and not, with not adding too much extra water into the hive at this time. Right, so two to one, it doesn't really matter if you do it by measure or by weight, it's not rocket science. It's just that uh, it takes, uh, if you have really hot water, you can mix two parts of sugar to one part of water without having to <coughs> boil the water or anything like that, just really hot tap water. Any higher ratio, then you will have to heat. It just won't take the sugar unless you uh, raise the temperature to a higher. And I would avoid boiling water to make your syrup because high temperatures cause the sugar to caramelize and that is actually poisonous to the bees. The higher the HMF, do we? What's HMF? 
a really long chemical name. Right. <laughs> it's caused by, by heating uh, sugars too high, and uh, that turned out to be a real big problem with some of the earlier versions of high fructose corn syrup. They were processed at a high level, high temperature, which didn't bother Coca-Cola or other people, but when you fed it to bees, it was a big issue. And so, um, you, you want to just, you know, hot water's not, you know, ta hot tap water's not bad. So one to one is really pretty thin, and it, but it has a tendency to be very stimulative. And so, you know, you put that in, and the queen's going to start laying like crazy, and uh, they'll use it all up, and, and then they'll want some more. And, and at this time of year, you're, you'll get some stimulation with two parts to one, but you'll also regain, regain weight gain in your hive will be significant, and you're trying to do both. So, generally speaking, we use a thicker syrup in fall than we do in the spring. Does that answer your question? Two sugars to one water. Yes. And you can just do a two cups to one cup. Or you can do two pounds to one pound, either one. Okay? Any other questions? Get back here. Rambling. Yeah. How, how long do you do that? I mean, um, you, well, I know there's not an exact science, but kind of there's a, what's a guideline we can use? George, we can, we're actually going to post that information on our uh, web page, on our <coughs> Facebook page, too. Because right. so we only got about five minutes left. Okay. Right. I'm very close. We'll have that, we'll have that available. I'm very close to the end. end. But, okay. you know, uh, we, we, do, we start this in, um, in early September. And right now we're just really against it, and we're trying to get the hives to a certain point and weight. And um, <coughs> after October 20th, it's really it gets harder and harder. And at that point, it's just weight gain. Um, it, if you don't have root being raised at that time, it's pretty tough. But you know, uh, my stuff. We used to think September 1st was okay, but I think that August 1st or August 5th or something like that is a great time to start your mite controls, at least your monitoring, find out where you are. Um, and that's because the viruses are an issue. And our all of the, our other stuff, the medicating and our feeding and our pollen substitute, all that goes through September and October. Um, but that's just the way we do it. They do it in California <coughs> later because their winter starts later than our stuff. So it's, it, it's not that simple, but I don't think, uh, the danger is to start too late, put it that way. So late winter inspection, this is I think the last thing I'm looking at here. So you can lift the hive and you can do that from time to time anyway, just so you kind of get a calibration of what, what does that mean, you know? How many frames is that? But you can be fooled because water is heavy. If, you're, if you have a waterlogged hive, it'll be a lot heavier than one that's dry. Um, pollen is heavy. There are some cases where you have a lot of pollen and no honey, and so you you know I mean you have to just just one measure and then you have to kind of verify that that's what what you're doing. But in the winter time when it's really cold and you may not want to open your hive, you can kind of keep track of things with a with just a lid, and you can do a lid check and you can kind of see where what size the cluster is, if, and you usually be able to see if there's any honey right there at the top bars, and those are small indicators. Opening up a hive for a few moments on a mild winter day is not gonna hurt anything. I would not open up, I'm not saying open it up, take all the brood and scatter it around and look for the queen for an hour. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're just looking and you're just seeing. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. But you, you know, if you need it to emergency, I'm not saying don't. If it's what you have to do to save your hive, well, okay, but you want to try and avoid it. And uh, if you want to treat mites effectively, um, it's a lot easier to kill mites that are on the backs of bees than that's in root. And there are a couple of materials you can use. Hopguard is one, oxalic acid is another. I'm not going to go into any of this stuff. Oxalic acid is easily acquired. It's used to bleach wood and clean decks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think we're going to get it approved by the EPA here by next spring. But at any rate, those are two things that you could use in such a way that you could kill all the phoretic mites when there's no brood in the hive. 
in the winter time. Um, and so you might want to do that as a cleanup. The trick is to get to Thanksgiving without having your bees just fail. But if you could do something in the fall that would get your numbers down and then do a cleanup in the winter or early, early January, early February, you can, you can do a tremendous amount of mite control at that time because there's no food. Okay, this is what I just thought. So feeding during winter stimulates activity using up the clock for old bees will actually increase honey consumption. It should be only done in emergencies. So, uh, small clusters, you can combine them so that you uh, make one out of two, and the one is more likely to survive. Uh, but if you have two queenless small clusters and you put them together, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help anything. I mean, if they're both really sick, uh, combining them isn't going to help. But uh, you can often piggyback them uh, and share the heat from below. And, but um, you need more than just a food excluder. You need something that will allow the heat to go through but doesn't allow uh, contact between the bees or pheromone exchange. So, uh, but it's, sometimes people will put a divider board in it, like a 10 frame box, they put a divider board and put a nuke on each side, and then they share the heat in the middle, they'll migrate to the middle. And um, you might want to put, you know, one exit that way and the other exit this way so that they're not coming out side by side. Uh, but that's one, another way, and then when you have the worst weather, you just pick them up and put them in the garage where it's cool but not cold, and then when the weather strains up, you can them back outside. Uh, you know, overwintering small clusters is, is tough, and it's high risk, and uh, so uh, these are just some tricks. And so there's one guy that is uh, overwintering nukes over a single, and uh, I don't really know, it's just a picture I found, so I'm not too sure what kind of divider he had, uh, but that's, that's basically the idea. All right, any questions or you want to? Yeah? A couple of years ago there was a report that uh, bees overwintered very much better in an enhanced CO2 atmosphere. Right. Which would seem to be really easy to do in a commercial operation, but I haven't heard anything more about it. But well, there's some work that probably will be published uh, in the next year. Uh, there's a lot of work being done up in Yakima with uh, a large commercial outfit up there that's overwintering bees in uh, apple storage facilities. And they're in a situation where they can uh, regulate CO2. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. The levels of CO2 are the kind of thing that if you went in, it would kill you. Real quick. And it's not the kind of facility that you're likely to have in your backyard or in your basement or anything like that, so we really... But it, it is an interesting thing. And, uh, I mean, a lot of these are overwintered in Idaho and potato cellars just with controlled uh, temperature and air. So those guys uh, put them in potato cellars after the potatoes are all sold. They rent the potato cellar. They're completely dark, absolutely dark, and they have high volume air exchange and they keep them around 42 to 44 degrees. Absolute dark. And uh, they have good success. When the bees are healthy and strong, they do very, very nicely in that kind of a controlled atmosphere. And Canada has a lot of money invested in uh, subsidies for beekeepers to put bees inside, building buildings specifically for overwintering bees. The CO2 thing has some, some potential. I don't really honestly know that much because nothing's been published yet, but uh, I don't know, maybe Dewey wants to talk about it, if you know anything. Yeah, I, it, it's tricky inside. It, it, it's very, very tricky. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, can you say something about how you monitor for pollen and how you actually find the pollen Oh, we, we buy pollen substitute by, by the semi-load. Uh, you know, we started out about five or seven years ago using two pounds a year and we're up to 12 or 14 pounds per column per year and it doesn't look like it's bending. We feed in two different ways. We feed mostly inside the hive with a, a doughy mixture of rouge yeast and a commercially available rouge yeast and soy flour with a sweetener and usually some vitamins and 
other things. Um, if you see for ingredients, I guess they won't tell you what they are. But, no. but um, yeah, we use that a lot in the spring, and um, and we use a, a tremendous amount in the fall to stimulate root rearing. But we also keep dry feed out in our largest bee yards. And I don't have a picture of it here, but when bees are really desperate for pollen in the late, like right now, or first thing in the spring in California, um, in the, we say spring, February, in the winter, uh, the bees just go crazy on that stuff. Has you started picking it up in your in your yard? Didn't you say that you would? Yeah, no, they have, well, I, I put it in, I have a top bar hive, but I have an apprentice with one, and it, they picked it up once I put it in the hive, but they haven't yet. I'm just, I'm gonna put some out again and see, see what happens. Well, yeah. Well, it's it's the same thing. It's brewed yeast and soy flour and it's some dry. sweetener, and it's dry, and you put it out, and they, and they actually fly onto it and uh, roll in it and, and put it on their legs and store it in the cell. When you put the, the uh, doughy patty in there, they actually eat that. It'll never show up in the cell. And they eat it and they store it in their fat bodies, I guess. And, is that right? Yeah. And so it becomes, uh, they become fat bees instead of skinny bees. And they're much, much better winter bees when they have that high protein content. And then they, they're also able to start rooting in their early spring. So, but beekeeping at my level is, uh, you know, anybody that's selling this stuff commercially, if you have a product that the beekeepers like, they're doing really well right now. So, uh, and I don't know, we really know how much of it yet is good and exactly what time of the year, so we're just throwing it in there and just assume if they eat it, that's a good thing. But uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, if you were interested in something like that, the, uh, the bee supply houses usually have the powder stuff available to you. Some of, some of them you could probably get individual patties pre-mixed and, and stuff, uh, the powdered stuff you would mix with water or with uh, sugar syrup and take your own uh, peanut buttery kind of a thing and put it in on the top bars. Uh, and the bees just light up like hogs at a trough. Um, are you going to be able to stay after a little bit? Mine is going to be, or are you going to be I'm okay. There was one other question. Okay. Well, mine is real simple. Where do you get your, your, um, your patties? Who do you get your patties from? What do you use your patties? Well, global or? I, I use global patties, and we do buy the, uh, the product that has 4% uh, bee collected pollen in it. It just seems as though we're, we're sure that it's more attractive to the bees and they eat it a little faster. And if diversity is good, then that bee collected pollen provides some diversity of protein. Uh, they, they make it in any, you know, you can give them whatever recipe. We used to try 15 and even 25%. It's pretty expensive, and honestly, couldn't see the difference in, in the outcome. So, but the dry stuff uh, that we put out, uh, we're actually using a different product from Man Life Supply. They're ultra bees, high protein, and uh, there wasn't a month in the summer when the bees didn't go for it. Although not the way they are right now. Right now, it's just a frenzy of feeding on it. How about a big hand for George?